And I am quite thrilled to be talking about one of my favorite people from the Civil War, Susie King Taylor. And let me just ask, has anybody, is anybody familiar with Susie King Taylor? We've got a, a, a few staff who are, but uh, uh, a lot of people are, are not familiar with her. And her memoirs, to me, are some of the most impactful memoirs that I've read uh, from the Civil War. And I entitled this Susie King Taylor's Civil War because I was kind of thinking about Mary Chestnut's and uh, the edition of hers is called Mary Chestnut's Civil War and how these two memoirs compare. And certainly Mary Chestnut is the better known of the two. In fact, if you're a student of the Civil War, you're familiar with Mary Chestnut. She happened to be there at some key moments. She was in Montgomery, Alabama when the Confederacy was formed. She was in Charleston when the first shots were fired. She came to Richmond when it became capital of the Confederacy. And Mary Chestnut left this uh, remarkable account of kind of high society, high Confederate society during the Civil War. Now, Susie's memoirs are a contrast to that. And I think uh, they're very valuable because Susie was really a part of history. Her t story, too, is unique in that she is the only African-American woman to write a memoir about her life with the Army during the war. Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson of the 33rd United States Colored Troops put it this way. He said, actual military life is rarely described by a woman, and this is especially true of a woman whose place was in the ranks. No such description has ever been given, I am sure, by one thus connected with a colored regiment. And then he went on to commend Susie's memoirs to those who loved the plain record of simple lives led in stormy periods. And I think that's an excellent description of Susie's life. So let me introduce you to her. She was born Susie Baker on August 6, 1848. She was the first child of Hagar and Raymond Baker. And Susie was born into slavery on the farm of Valentine Grest, a Swissman, on the Isle of Wight in Liberty County, Georgia. So it's about 35 miles south of Savannah. But in kind of a unique twist of events, Susie and her younger brother and sister were allowed to go to Savannah, Georgia and live with their grandmother. And if you think about this, this is pretty unique because most enslaved children were put to work at very young ages and even if they weren't full hands, they're half hands. They're doing a half day's work or they're removing rocks from the uh, field tending to animals, this sort of thing. But Susie and her younger brother and sister were quite privileged to have this opportunity to go to Savannah. And before I go into that, let me talk um, a little bit about Susie's uh, family background because uh, she does in her memoirs write about um, the fact that her great-great-grandmother came from Virginia, that she was born in Virginia, that she was half American Indian. And um, we don't know exactly how Susie's family got to Georgia. My guess is that they were sold south, with Richmond being the second leading center of the slave trade, some 300,000 slaves being sold south or down river. That's mostly, most likely what happened, either with Susie's great-great-grandmother, who lived to be 120, or, <laughs> which wow. is amazing, yeah. or her grandmother, who uh, also lived to be 100 and something, maybe like 103. Uh, so both of her, uh, her great-great-grandmother and her great-grandmother were long-lived, and she did write that her great-grandmother passed away in Georgia. So we know they were in Georgia by that point. Susie's grandmother was a woman named Dolly Reed. And we don't know for certain whether Dolly Reed was enslaved or whether she had been emancipated. 
the one thing that Susie writes about this is that her grandmother uh, had to get the signature of Valentine Grest to continue residing in, Cal in uh, Savannah. But she does mention, Susie mentions, that this was the case with emancipated people as well as enslaved. So in a way, that uh, I think uh, hints at the fact that perhaps Dolly Reed was free. Another thing that we know about Dolly Reed, which is quite interesting, is that uh, she was quite an entrepreneur. One thing that she would do is she would go to the Isle of Wight, visit her family there about four times a year. But she would load up her wagon with all sorts of city goods that she would bring out to the country and sell or trade for country items, produce and eggs and vegetables and that sort of thing, and then bring them back into the city and sell those fresh goods to people living inside Savannah. Dolly Reed also prized education. She felt um, that was important, and we know that because she sent Susie and her brother to what was known as a bucket school. And a bucket school was a clandestine school that was operated to teach black people to read and write, because it was against the law for a person of color to learn how to read and write. And these were called bucket schools because sometimes the children going to school would hide their books in a bucket so that they would not be noticed. And Susie went to the, a school run by a friend of her grandmother's, a free woman named Mary Woodhouse. And she recorded in her memoirs, we went every day about 9 o'clock with our books wrapped in paper to prevent the police or white persons from seeing them. We went in, one at a time, through the gate into the yard to the L kitchen, which was the schoolroom. She had 25 or 30 children whom she taught, assisted by her daughter, Mary Jane. The neighbors would see us going in sometimes, but they supposed we were learning trades, as it was custom to give children a trade of some kind. After school, we left the same way we entered, one by one. Then we would go to a square about a block from the school and wait for each other. Susie attended this school for two or more years, and then she was tutored by a free black woman whom she names as Mary Beasley, which is most likely Matilda Beasley, who uh, was known for operating a school there in Savannah. Susie was a quick learner, and by May of 1860, Mrs. Beasley told her grandmother that she had taught Susie everything that she knew. And at this point, Susie Taylor, um, or um, Susie Baker, was only 11 years old she did find ways to continue learning. She had a playmate and friend named Katie O'Connor whose mother gave her permission to give Susie lessons. And then later, Susie's grandmother hired James Bois, who was her landlord's son, to be a tutor for Susie. And he tutored her until mid-1861 when he joined the Savannah Volunteer Guard and went away to fight in the war. And we do know a little bit about James Bois. He deserted on December 4, 1864, and was received at Bermuda 100 on December 5th, where he took the oath of allegiance. The coming of the Civil War brought changes to Susie's life. Uh, one thing that happened was her grandmother ended up being arrested in a raid on a church. Her grandmother, Dolly Reed, had broken curfew to go to a church outside of the city limits. And they did a very treasonous thing during this church service. They sang hymns about freedom. So uh, Dolly Reed was briefly imprisoned and then released. But as a result of that, Susie ended up being sent back to the Grest Farm. Now, I want to kind of set the backdrop for kind of what happens next. On November 7th, 1861, the Union had taken Port Royal, South Carolina, and began uh, what became known as the Port Royal Experiment. With the occupation of South Carolina's Sea Islands uh, by Union troops, there were a lot of white planters who fled. They fled before the Union Army came in. They left behind about 10,000 enslaved people, 
and fields ready to be harvested, fields full of cotton. So the Union Army put those former slaves to work, harvesting about 90,000 pounds of cotton. And they paid these former slaves a dollar for every 400 pounds that they harvested, which seems like a really small amount. But this was the first time freed slaves were able uh, to earn a wage for their work. This is the first example of the Union Army paying them. Now, these contrabands, as they were called, as a result of General Benjamin Butler's policy of declaring enslaved people coming into his lines at Fort Monroe, contraband of war, uh, they were placed under the control of the United States Department of Treasury. And the Secretary of Treasury, Sam and Chase, sent his friend Edward Pierce, who was uh, from Boston. He was a lawyer. He was an author, a philanthropist. But he sent Pierce to uh, Port Royal to kind of assess the situation of the freedmen. Now, at the same time, the American Missionary Society sent Reverend Mansfield French to Port Royal. So you have this uh, kind of partnership of the federal government with the American Missionary Society. And the Fred federal government managed the employment of the contrabands. They're the ones giving him, them those jobs on the cotton plantations. And then the missionary societies sought to educate the freedmen. So this idea of preparing them for emancipation. Now, on April 11, 1862, Fort Pulaski at the mouth of the Savannah River fell to Union troops. So the Union Army has taken the Sea Islands along uh, the coast of South Carolina, now moving into Georgia. And upon the capture of Fort Pulaski, Major General David Hunter, who was in command of the Department of the South, de declared all the slaves therein free. And this declaration kind of went unnoticed, but on May 9th, he went a step further. Hunter issued General Orders Number 11. And in this general order, he declared that slaves and martial law in a free country, altogether incompatible, the persons in these three states, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina, heretofore held as slaves, are therefore declared forever free. Now, he didn't consult with anyone about this order, and President Lincoln found out about it through the newspapers. Needless to say, Lincoln was not very happy about this. Previously, he had rescinded an order issued by John C. Fremont on August 30th, 1861. Hunter's order is very similar. Lincoln at this time is very worried about keeping the border states in the Union. And these kind of declarations are uh, detrimental to that idea. Now, the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, and Secretary Salmon Chase wanted Lincoln to uphold Hunter's order. But Lincoln didn't do that. He issued his own proclamation on May 22nd, rescinding General Orders Number 11. And Lincoln at this time was also pushing this idea of compensated emancipation. On March 6th, he had made an appeal to Congress about this. So in this uh, order or this proclamation that he sends out on May 22nd, he kind of restates this idea and he promised cooperation with any state which may adopt a gradual abolishment of slavery. So it was in this climate of tremendous change and uncertainty that Susie, along with her uncle and his family, decided to flee to the Sea Islands and join other enslaved people who were seeking the protection of the Union Army. Susie recorded in her memoir that her father served aboard a gunboat, but she doesn't record when he seized his freedom. She mentions uh, running away with her uncle and his family, so we don't know when her father left. He may have left before this, maybe after. And Susie doesn't really mention uh, her mother, what choice her mother made. 
Now, just two days after the Union troops took Fort Pulaski is when Susie and her family went to St. Catharines Island. And St. Catharines is not uh, labeled here, but see where it says Thunderbolt, the island that's just below that black dot, that's St. Catharines. They were not there for very long before they were transported to St. Simon's Island, which was more firmly in Union hands. Susie had not been on St. Simon's long when the Union Army found out about her education, that she could read and write. So they asked her if she would be willing to start a school. Now at this point, Susie Baker is only 14 years old. But she was placed in charge of a school. She said she would do that if they'd get her books. And very soon there were two large boxes of books and Bibles that arrived. Susie taught children during the daytime and then at night she would teach uh, free adults who were coming to her. Her school was located at Gaston Bluff. She had about 40 pupils there. And uh, she recalled that Reverend French with the American Missionary Society would visit her school from time to time and lecture on Boston and the North. Susie Baker also writes about how dangerous it was on St. Simon's at this time, that there were Confederates who were able to sneak aboard the, or sneak onto the island, that there were fugitive slaves who were killed in skirmishes with the rebels. So finally, the U.S. Marines come in to find these Confederates. But she was, uh, because of this, she and, and many of the freedmen were afraid to go very far from their living quarters, uh, even in the daytime, but especially at night, she wrote that she did not live, leave her living quarters. But she continued to operate this school until the fall of 1862, and then she and the other refugees were transported to Beaufort, South Carolina, and there's a shot of the Freedmen's School that was located there. Now, in July 1862, Congress granted the first official authorization of African-American troops with the Second Confiscation and Militia Act. There were five regiments formed. One of those was the first South Carolina Volunteers, and they were formed by order of General Rufus B. Saxton. Now, I forgot to mention that back when General Hunter had taken Fort Pulaski, one thing that he did after declaring enslaved people free was to begin to try to recruit black troops for his army. And he did have a regiment called the First South Carolina Volunteers, but this was not recognized by the federal government. It was disbanded. Uh, and there were some issues with the way that Hunter had done that because he really didn't give those freedmen a choice. He kind of impressed them uh, into this regiment. So this is the, the first First, or the second first South Carolina volunteers, if you want to think of it that way. In December 1862, Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was an abolitionist from Massachusetts, was placed in command of this regiment. And then sometime in late 1862 or 1863 is when Susie married Edward King. Edward King was or had been an enslaved carpenter in Darien, Georgia, and he specifically ran away to join the regiment and to volunteer to fight for the Union. King had been educated, Susie mentions that, so they have kind of the same level of education. He became a sergeant in Company, Company E of the first South Carolina Volunteers. Susie signed up as a laundress. And she writes how on January 1st, 1863, there's a great celebration held at Camp Saxton, which is outside of Beaufort. Everyone gathered there for the reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. So that's when the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect, January 1st, 1863. We should note that the proclamation only freed enslaved people in the areas in rebellion, in those southern states, not in the border states. But it's recognized, though, as 
a great step forward. So this celebration takes place at Camp Saxon. It's also that that the proclamation that officially uh, calls for the um, that African American men can serve in the U.S. Army. So uh, it kind of broadens that confiscation act. But there's this celebration, and amid speeches and patriotic songs, there were two beautiful flags presented to the regiment. Susie recalled this day in her memoirs. She said, it was a glorious day for us all, and we enjoyed every minute of it. As a fitting close and the crowning event of this occasion, we had a grand barbecue. A number of oxen were roasted whole, and we had a fine feast, although not served as tastily or correctly as it would have been at home. Yet it was enjoyed with keen appetites and relish. The soldiers had a good time. They sang or shouted hurrah all through the camp and seemed overflowing with fun and frolic until taps was sounded when many, no doubt, dreamt of this memorable day. During her time with the 33rd, Susie did um, much more than just be a laundress. In fact, she wrote that she very, did very little of that because she was too busy doing other things. She continued to teach these men how to read and write, and she also uh, worked as a nurse. And she wrote that she was not afraid to treat men when there was a smallpox outbreak because she had been vaccinated. And she also wrote that she believed in the power of sassafras tea to strengthen her blood. She was not squeamish about tending to the wounded. This is what she said about caring for the wounded. It seems strange how our aversion to seeing suffering is overcome by war how we are able to see the most sickening sights, such as men with their limbs blown off and mangled by the deadly shell without a shudder, and instead how we hurry to assist in alleviating their pain, bind up their wounds, and press the cool water to their parched lips with feelings only of sympathy and pity. She grew accustomed to the rigors of camp life, to coarse food, to extremes of heat and cold, even to flea bites. She also wrote that she learned to handle a musket very well and assisted in cleaning the guns and used to fire them off to see if the cartridges were dry. She recalled that she could even shoot straight and often hit the target. Now, on February 9th, 1866, the 33rd United States Colored Troops were mustered out of service. And Susie thrilled at the promise in the words of Lieutenant Colonel C.T. Trowbridge as he addressed the troops on this last occasion. He said, the flag of our fathers now floats from Maine to California and beholds only free men. Every prospect before you is full of hope and encouragement. The nation guarantees to you full protection and justice. Soon, though, harsh reality sat in. Susie and her husband, Edward King, returned to Savannah. And King, who had been this skilled carpenter, had trouble finding work because of the competition and the prejudice that existed. He ended up getting contracts, unloading the cargoes of ships. Susie, uh, tried to make money at teaching school, charging students a dollar a head. Edward King, though, on September 16, 1866, was killed in an accident. And Susie was left alone as a widow and as an expectant mother. After her son was born, she tried to continue teaching at her school but the American Missionary Society through uh, the Beach Institute started offering classes for free. And that cut into Susie's business. Why pay when you could go to this free uh, place of learning? And then uh, things got worse when the school started offering night classes as well. Susie was left with no other option than to close her school and then um, she decided to make a living in one of the few ways that was available for a black woman at the time. She became 
a domestic servant. And as a live-in servant, she couldn't take her son with her, so she left him with her mother, who uh, was widowed at this point. Now, interestingly enough, Susie writes that her mother uh, fared very well, that she owned a grocery store and then was able to eventually purchase 700 acres of land. Susie held a number of different domestic positions and ended up working for a family in Boston. And that is where she met Russell Taylor, her last husband. Uh, she met him in 1879 and married him. Now, as a married woman, she didn't have to worry about supporting herself. But she was an active woman. She wanted to find things to do. So she devoted herself to veterans aid projects. And this photograph is a little later time period, 1912, but I thought it kind of fit the spirit of what Susie did. She helped organize Corps 67 of the Women's Relief Corps, which was a support branch of the Grand uh, Army of the Republic, and she sponsored all sorts of activities. She served as a guard, a secretary, a treasurer, and eventually as president of the Re Women's Relief Corps in 1893. And one of the duties that she had was to compile a list of the war veterans that were living in Massachusetts. And as she was doing this and talking to people, they kept encouraging her to write her memoirs, that she had this unique, amazing story that needed to be told. So she did. Her memoirs were published in 1902, Reminiscences of My Life in Camp. And as I mentioned, she was the only African-American woman to publish a memoir about her experiences with the Army. And I think one of the few African-American women to publish a memoir about the Civil War in general. In this book, and this book is available, I'm pretty sure it's still in the gift shop, we usually have it, and uh, it's also available online. But you can read her memoirs today, and I think they're still very impactful. Not only does she go into her experiences with the Army and what she did, but she asked the question, was the war in vain? And there were some things that made her think this. In February of 1898, Susie traveled back to the South to Shreveport, Louisiana to see her son. Her son had been traveling with a troupe of actors and became ill and after his illness stretched on for a few weeks, his friends sent for her to come. And as she traveled back to the South, Susie experienced discrimination firsthand. Now, think about the time period in which this is happening. This is 1898. This is two years after the Supreme Court upheld the doctrine of separate but equal in Plessy versus Ferguson. So uh, as she travels back, she is forced to ride in a separate car for colored people. She was roughly questioned by two policemen who were seeking a man, and they thought she, for some reason, knew where he was. And most uh, heart-wrenching of all, when she wanted to purchase a berth to bring her dying son back home, she was not allowed to do that. So she wrote, it seemed very hard when his father fought to protect the Union and our flag, and yet his boy was denied under this same flag a birth to carry him home to die because he was a Negro. She also, while she was there caring for her son, heard of a few murders that had been committed, and on this return trip, she even witnessed a lynching. So all this she records. And I wanted to conclude this talk with some of Susie's own words. So I think they still resonate today. Uh, these are her thoughts on present conditions. She said, I must say a word on the general treatment of my race, both in the North and the South, in this 20th century. I wonder if our white fellow men realize the true sense or meaning of brotherhood. For 200 years, we had toiled for them. The War of 1861 came and was ended, and we thought our race was forever freed from bondage. 
and that the two races could live in unity with each other. But when we read almost every day of what is being done to my race by some whites in the South, I sometimes ask, was the war in vain? Has it brought freedom in the full sense of the word, or has it not made our condition more hopeless? In this land of the free, we are burned, tortured, and denied a fair trial, murdered by any or murdered for any imaginary wrong conceived in the brain of the Negro-hating white man. There is no redress for us from a government which promised to protect all under its flag. Seems a mystery to me. They say one flag, one nation, one country, invisible. Indivisible. Is this true? I do not uphold my race when they do wrong. They ought to be punished, but the innocent are made to suffer as well as the guilty. I may not live to see it, but I hope the day is not far distant when the two races will reside in peace in the Southland. And we will sing with sincere and truthful hearts, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. So that concludes uh, my talk on Susie King Taylor. I hope uh, this will encourage you to read her memoirs because I, uh, I think they provide just an excellent account of this aspect of the Civil War that sometimes we uh, don't think a lot about. But any questions? Yes? Oh, you know, I have to ask a question. Um, <laughs> do we have any accounts of her actually um, trying to escape during the Civil War? There, she does not go into that. She just um, says that she fled with her uncle and his family. So she doesn't, uh, you know, provide any specifics. But with the Union Army that close, it was just becoming easier and yeah. easier to just run away. Mm -hmm. uh, but she doesn't go into specifics of exactly, you know, how they did it. Uh, and it, there's not a lot of information on Susie King Taylor out there apart from her memoirs. So it is, uh, you know, like for instance with her grandmother, was Dolly Reed free? Was she enslaved? Uh, so there are a lot, you know, of, of questions. Anything else? Any other thing? Yes. Well, did she only serve in a domestic uh, capacity in the army? Uh, she was a laundress, so she was she you know she was not as a soldier. Her husband was, and she she really did perform the duties of a nurse. And she does write um, you know a few specifics about that. But she is uh, she's as a laundress on the ar army rolls, but she's not uh, was not a soldier. Of course, women couldn't be soldiers, so ever near combat? Um, close to it. She, uh, but not in the, like, in the midst of it. She wasn't going out onto the battlefield removing soldiers or anything like that. Uh, but she, you know, she did travel with the regiment and then would stay in camp as uh, they went out on skirmishes and expeditions and that sort of thing. Uh, she uh, enters with the army, uh, after uh, uh, Charleston is taken uh, and, and talks about her experiences there uh, as they uh, kind of put out, the, the soldiers put out the fires and that kind of thing, but yes. Was her son her only child? Yes, her only, only child. Did, and he, did he have children who were married? I don't think so, and she doesn't. She doesn't write much about him. It's just in that, um, in that, in that chapter was the war in vain. She talks about going um, to to his deathbed, really, and she mentions the play in which he performed. It was called The Lion's Bride, and uh, I actually found a sketch of it. Uh, and he was with a troop of actors, but she, that's about all she says of him. Uh, yes, she is buried at, I wrote it down because I always forget where it is. It's just outside of Boston, Rosendale, Rosendale at the Mount Hope Cemetery. And that's where Edward King is buried as well, and he evidently died before she did. I was not able to find any specifics on it, so I, I don't know. Yeah, But she, she did have a... a relatively short life compared to them. She, another thing that she writes about in her memoirs 
is that on at least two, maybe three occasions, she came very close to drowning. There was a, a shipwreck at one point, and then uh, during the war, there was a, a like a small boat that she was on that capsized. And after, I think it was the second or the third time, she wrote that uh, she she just felt like it was her faint fate that she wouldn't die from drowning uh, because she had survived these accidents at sea and in a river and uh, so but I don't know beyond that yeah well thank you all for coming today